Hello, I'm Steve Buck, Chair of the Department of Psychology here at the University of Washington. The lecture you're about to see is part of our annual Alan Edwards Psychology Lecture Series. Professor Edwards was affiliated with the Department of Psychology for half a century until his death in 1994. He was an outstanding teacher, researcher, and writer who introduced new statistical techniques that are credited with changing the way modern psychological research is conducted. Allen also permanently enhanced the intellectual climate of UW Psychology by endowing the Allen Edwards Lectureship, which since 1999 has brought an impressive list of renowned psychologists to the UW campus to interact with faculty and students. Now, the annual Allen Edwards Psychology Lecture Series presents the excitement of psychological research and its tangible benefits to both local and national audiences. The lecture you're about to watch is one of a pair given back-to-back -back that matched a UW Psychology faculty member with a visiting researcher to talk about a topic of great public and scientific interest. Good evening, I'm Steve Buck, Chair of the Department of Psychology here at the University of Washington. Welcome to this evening's continuation of the Alan Edwards Psychology Lecture Series. This series is presented by the Department of Psychology, the College of Arts and Sciences, and the University of Washington Alumni Association, and is funded by a generous endowment from Alan Edwards. The topics in this series illustrate how psychological research serves humanity. The University of Washington receives more research support money than any other public university in the country, topping $1 billion this year. The Department of Psychology alone receives over $11 million annually in research funding that helps us advance our knowledge of basic science, directly serve people in our community and around the globe, and train our undergraduate and graduate students. Tonight's lecture addresses the psychology of blink, understanding how our minds work unconsciously. Our speaker is Dr. Anthony Greenwald. Dr. Greenwald is professor of psychology and director of the Laboratory of Implicit and Unconscious Cognition here at the University of Washington. He received his PhD in psychology from Harvard University and his undergraduate degree from Yale, putting him on both sides of that classic rivalry. He served on the faculty here at UW since 1986. Dr. Greenwald's work in social psychology, social cognition, stereotypes and prejudice, and most recently, implicit and unconscious cognition, has built an international reputation. His research has been supported for more than 40 years by grants from the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Mental Health. His achievements were recently recognized by election as a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the only current member of our department to be so honored. He's also received numerous other honors and has edited or co-authored five books and over 140 scholarly articles and book chapters. Please help me welcome Dr. Tony Greenwald. Thank you, Steve, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, participating in this series uh, endowed by Alan Edwards. I arrived here while Alan was still uh, active as an emeritus faculty member, and I am very honored to participate in this series. Uh, this, as, as many of you know, the book Blink uh, was written uh, by Malcolm Gladwell a few years ago, and the title was The Power of Thinking Without Thinking. Uh, before I go on to develop the topic, which has to do with the theme of unconscious process that Malcolm Gladwell wrote about, I want to introduce my two primary collaborators who have participated with me in much of the work that I will be talking about. Uh, Mazarin Banaji, who's a professor at Harvard University, and Brian Nozick, who is a 
professor at University of Virginia, uh, Steve mentioned that this research has been supported by NSF and NIMH, and Project Implicit is a nonprofit that has been set up by the three of us to operate a website that I will tell you a little bit about later. Back to the lecture. Uh, I have an alternate title I'm calling this the second level, and this again is something I am borrowing from Malcolm Gladwell, who I heard talk about this topic. Uh, it was on Oprah's show, and he, re he referred to the second level as the subject of uh, this, actually this talk, and the subject of the research that I have been involved with, which is what he was talking about. Uh, I was very pleased uh, when he was appearing on Oprah. Here's an overview of what I plan to do in this lecture. I first want to uh, describe what we can call the first level of mental operation, which is higher process, it's deliberate, it's rational, it's thoughtful, it's the way we think we operate most of the time. Then there's the second level, which is my main focus. It is in some sense lower, it's automatic, it has been called impulsive and unthinking. I will describe for you the Implicit Association Test, or IAT, which is a procedure created here in my laboratory at University of Washington a little over a decade ago. Since then, it has been the subject of active research, not only here, but in many places. Its virtue is that it provides a window into parts of level two, and it has made things observable that had not been observable with other techniques. Then I will wrap up trying to uh, deal with some implications, talking about the topic of implicit bias, which is the area of application that many researchers, including us at University of Washington and at Yale, uh, Yale Banaji was at Yale before she went to Harvard, excuse me. Yale, Harvard, and University of Virginia uh, have been working on. Now, for a change of pace, and there will be a few changes of pace during this lecture, uh, a card trick. Uh, I'm going to show you some cards. I want you to pick a card. I'll give you a few seconds to look at that. Pick any one. Okay, now think about your card for a few seconds. Uh, I don't have a magician's assistant here, so I'm going to have PowerPoint. <laughs> Uh, make your card disappear. Did your card disappear? For how, for how many of you did the card disappear? Okay, I have to say that almost everyone in the audience is raising their hands. Quite a trick. Uh, I will come back to that later. <laughs> there will be an explanation. But changing pace again, Back to level two and examples of level two at work. When we do familiar uh, motor tasks, meaning muscle tasks involving our muscles, such as driving, tying shoes, riding a bicycle, or walking, we are doing this usually without thinking about it, and most of us are aware of doing it without thinking. You've probably had the experience of having driven along a familiar route and uh, not been able to report later how many red lights uh, you encountered, uh, etc., uh, or driving past where you intended to go because you were so deeply into level two that you didn't even notice where you wanted to stop. Uh, in familiar social interactions, such as our interactions with clerks in stores, uh, with other people in the offices we work in, in schools, maybe even sitting in lectures, students or you now uh, are in level two. We process language very easily and we can actually understand language at level two. We don't have to think too much to understand. And obviously in performing practice athletic skills where the pros and the coaches tell you you want to just do it without thinking about it, you want to have practiced it so much that thought is not required. Some historical context for level two. It used to be called something else. In psychology's past, it was called the unconscious 
and unconscious was a noun. You'll see that unconscious is no longer a noun or not used as, as such by many psychologists. From 1900 approximately to 1965, Freud's theory of the unconscious, uh, his psychoanalytic theory was dominant. And for example, when I was an undergraduate and perhaps when many of you were undergraduates, you could not escape being thoroughly educated in Freud's theory in your introductory psychology class. That lasted until 1965, or maybe a little past, and I'm describing the next 15 years uh, with reverence to Freud as a latent period, uh, when the unconscious disappeared, became actually a non-respected word in academic psychology. But then things changed, and starting around 1980, cognitive psychologists started to develop new methods for studying unconscious processes. And since 1990, there is a very active movement, of which I consider my research a part, on what is called unconscious cognition. And now you'll notice that unconscious is an adjective. And sometimes we talk about doing things unconsciously, which is an adverb, but we don't really talk about the unconscious anymore. We have new research methods. There are many repeatable experimental findings. This was a real embarrassment during the psychoanalytic era that it was difficult to convert Freud's theories into research procedures that could be performed in laboratories and produce repeatable results. There were many attempts to study, for example, the phenomenon of repression, and basically they just did not work. The theory nowadays is much simpler than Freud's. As simple as it is, I am going to spare you it. Uh, we don't have time for that. But this recent work, since about 1990 and its precursors in the 1980s, has established the understanding of what I am in this lecture referring to as, as level two. Before I get further into level two, let's talk about what level one does. Level one is the higher level, the thinking level, uh, the one that is rational. When learning new motor tasks, such as starting to learn to play tennis or to ride a bicycle or to drive a car, we have to focus, we have to think, we have to use level one. When we are doing unfamiliar language tasks, such as proofreading or reading aloud, we use level one. If you have proofread anything that you have written silently, very likely you've let a few errors pass, and editors who ask you to proofread articles will suggest to you that you read aloud, which actually forces you into a level one mode that you might not otherwise use. Uh, Non-routine social interactions may require level one, and this is an illustration I like. So if you are asked, or if I am asked, how are you, you probably within less than half a second answer fine. Uh, I do. And that's really a level two answer. If you didn't give that answer, you would probably be capable of reciting a collection of problems, a headache, uh, uh, someone uh, didn't accept an article you wrote, or any, any number of unpleasant things that you could come up if you bothered to think about it, if you bothered to use level one. But generally, we answer that question, how are you, at level two. And when remembering a new name, this is a, an easy illustration because probably most of us remember having been introduced to someone and being given their name and processing it at level two, meaning that 10 seconds later uh, you had not a clue as to what that person's name, in, name was. Uh, most of the things you do at a restaurant, if it's at all familiar, like you don't have to study an unfamiliar menu, are probably done at level two, but when you have to compute the tip and figure out what uh, in my case, 18.5% uh, is of, uh, of the bill, uh, it's necessary to use level, level one, not level two. Working to overcome level two's effects is another thing that 
requires level one, requires your being more thoughtful. And I want to give you an idea of what the difficulty of overcoming level two's effects might be. Here's, uh, I'm telling you to start with that this is a visual illusion. And so when I ask you, are the shades of gray in squares A and B identical, you probably know that the correct answer is yes. But you're looking at it and you're saying, no way, that's not possible. Uh, what I'm saying is that the shades of gray that have in the squares that have letters A and B on them are actually these. They are, they probably now look identical. I've stripped away all the context. Uh, back here, I'm saying the, what A and B are sitting on in that image and in this image are exactly the same shades of gray. Uh, and even if you believed me, you can't make them look that way. So, and you probably don't believe me now, so I am going to have to prove this to you. What we can do is show that they are the same shade of gray and showing the illusion by taking away the context. And I'll do that just by taking away the squares that surround B. So they still look different. They probably still look different, but they're getting a little closer. I've taken away half of the context. They're getting pretty close now. And now you can see that they are actually the same shade of gray. So, and if I restore the context, the illusion comes back instantly and there's nothing you can do about it. This is, a, th this is an example of level one being unable to undo the automatic effects of level two because our perceptual systems have learned so well how to deal well, first of all, they've learned something about checkerboard patterns, but also how to deal with correcting for changes in the appearance of a color when it's in shadow, and that's what the situation is here. Show you how this works uh, in a different way, not by taking the context away, but by taking A and B away. And if I just move them up, you see as B goes through where A was, it now looks like A did and I take them out, you can recognize those other squares that I showed you, but I just have to put them back. And again, the illusion is restored. There's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> uh, moving on. Uh, I'm quoting now Roger Shepard, who is a perception psychologist, a, a brilliant researcher and theorist, who described the effect of illusions, and this is a quote from his book, Mind Sights, which has some illusions that he created himself. Any knowledge or understanding of the illusion we may gain at the intellectual level remains virtually powerless to diminish the magnitude of the illusion. That describes what you just experienced, and he, he, when he's talking about the intellectual level here, that's what we mean by level one, or that's the way I am referring to level one. Level one is actually unable to override perceptually. The best you can do is use that knowledge that I told you that it was an illusion. Use your understanding of these things and say, well, they must be the same. Otherwise, why would he be showing it to me? And so you can say they're the same even though they don't look the same. We learn from this illusion that context can have powerful effects. We know that these effects are ordinarily adaptive. When we're not looking at an image like the one I had you look at, those squares are actually the same shade of gray. Uh, and it's just that I'm asking you to tell me what that gray is actually on the screen rather than in real life. In real life, they would be the same shade of gray. It's an adaptive process that we are tapping into with this illusion. These effects can operate outside our awareness and beyond our conscious control. And we use these effects so easily that we actually don't know we are operating outside uh, of level one. We think we are being thoughtful, but we may not. And that brings me back to the card trick. So let's look at that again. Here's the first display, six cards. And the second display five cards. Now start to use level one 
and check the second display against the first display, and what you will find is what made the trick work. There is no card in the second display that was in the first display, which is why all the cards, any card you chose, disappeared. The trick works because you have the illusion, you kept the illusion that you were paying attention to the whole display, and you thought that the cards were the same. You actually hadn't extracted enough information from the display to understand that all the cards were changing. You were operating in the ordinary way at level two, but had the illusion that you were operating at level one. And some psychologists say, that's pretty much the way we go through most of our life. <laughs> uh, another change of pace. I want to describe the implicit association test, uh, which I'm going to demonstrate for you. What is the IAT? It's a measure of associative knowledge, it's, uh, which means knowledge of links uh, or associations are links that cause one concept to be activated by another. How does the IAT work? It's fairly simple. It's, uh, this is the whole theory of the IAT. If two concepts are associated, it's easy to produce the same response to representatives or examples of both. Here's an IAT measure of a stereotype association. And this is a, an association of male gender with career. Uh, we refer to this as a stereotype, as something that attributes a trait to a social category. The trait in this case is, uh, uh, what is the trait? It's uh, business, career, uh, and the uh, category it's associated with is male gender. We associate male with career. The IAT uses categories, and here are the categories, female and male, and it uses uh, other concepts that are associated with those categories. In this case, it's career and family, and you may recognize family as something that's more likely to be associated with female than with male. Then there are items for each of these categories. So for female and male, we're going to be using names that you can easily recognize as female or male. And for career and family, we're going to be using these words, office, executive, manager, salary, career, employment for career, kitchen, parents, babies, wedding, family, home for family. I'm going to need your participation. I'll need you to say left and right and not whisper. Uh, I, full participation is important. I'm going to be counting. I expect to hear every voice. Uh, loudness is important. I do need to hear. I need to hear whether you're saying left or right. I'm asking you to respond rapidly. And you'll, you may make some errors when you do any task rapidly. You're likely to make errors. Don't worry about them and don't try to correct them. Just wait for the next. I want you to say left if you see one of those female names, right if you see one of those male names. I am going to start with you, but then I'll drop out. My job is to press the keys on the keyboard when I hear you responding. If I hear errors, I'm going to slow down a little, delay my response, because when we do this task on a computer, we require subjects to change an incorrect response to a correct response, which takes a little addition of time. So uh, yeah, this is what we're doing first is practice. I'll tell you when the critical portion comes along, when we're going to pay attention to the time. So left, right, left. Okay, very good. You can see, a t uh, I don't know if you can read that, it says 680 milliseconds. Uh, either you're very fast or I'm hitting the keys very fast. It's one or the other. Uh, now the other task, left for career, right for family words. Again, I'll start with you, but I'll drop out soon. Right, left, right. Okay, this is all very good. Now, now, it, now it begins to get interesting. Uh, we're just gonna add those two tasks. So left for either career or female, right for either family or male. We're gonna do this twice 
And again, I'll start with you. So this isn't this first time. We'll look at the time, but the, we'll treat the second one as the serious one, OK? Right. It is amusing, isn't it? Uh, well, we're, we're, learning, we're learning something. Uh, let's do that again. See if you can do it faster. Uh, my guess is probably not, but let's see. Uh, here we go. This will be just a little longer series of items than the previous one. Uh, ready? Left for career or female, right for f male or family. Left. Well, I, I think that, if I remember, that was, I think you gained 14 milliseconds. Uh, or, uh, that's pretty good. Uh, OK, we're going to change the task now. It's just a simple change. We've switched the side of male and female. So now it's left for career words or male words, right for family or female words. Uh, I'll start along with you again. Right. Uh, what happened to all the errors? Okay, I don't. We don't need to do this again. Uh, you get, you get the point. Uh, that even though I had had you practicing exactly the opposite task through what we call two blocks of trials. I just changed the sides of career, or excuse me, male and female, and immediately you're faster. What the way that pick up in speed shows that you can do that part of the IAT at level two. It's easy. You don't really have to think much about what you're doing. It is the IAT, therefore, is picking up through your speed an association the mental association that you have that links female and, fa and family is what allows you to do that task at level two. The other version of it, which was uh, 300 milliseconds or so longer, three tenths of a second, and that doesn't seem like a lot, but in the world of this kind of research, it's near an, etern an eternity. Many psychologists uh, will be glad to get effects that are about one-tenth that size, and many journal articles are published re reporting effects of, of that magnitude. So this is absolutely a huge effect. But the reason we get that effect is that you discover that you have to work to oppose the associations. That's You're using level one to overcome the effect of associations that are making the task easy for you uh, in the second version that we did. So what are implicit biases, which the IAT has been used to measure? These are associations that correspond to familiar stereotypes and prejudices. And the IAT has revealed that implicit biases are surprisingly widespread. So the one we just did is actually one of the ones that we can find on the web. It's a gender, we call it a gender career stereotype. It, it, taps the associations involving female, usually with family, male uh, with career. And I'm going to show you some data. Uh, f f first, let me see if I can raise the demonstration website uh, to uh, show you uh, how you can find these on the web. Let me go back uh, here. It, this, 
This is the link if you're looking for it. I think if I click that now, it would probably go there, but I've already got it here. Uh, if you click this demonstration link, you get some preliminary instructions, which I uh, am processing now at level three. <laughs> uh, and then you get to select a test, and these, uh, there are 14 of them there now. And actually, the one we just did uh, is the one appearing on top here, gender, career. Uh, this green arrow means that you've got a flash uh, application loaded. You would click here to begin. Uh, I'm not actually going to do it. I'll just, and then, then you get asked some questions which I'm not going to answer. Uh, and then it shows you the stimuli that are, are going to be used in the test. We don't have to look at this. You've already experienced the IAT. Uh, this, this, uh, oh, the version we looked at on the web didn't show you all these pretty flags. There are 22 countries in, in which this site is operating, and there are IATs in 15 languages other than English. So here's what I wanted to show you, the data from the web. Uh, and that if you take one of these tests on the web, we give you an approximation of a result which can be characterized as something ranging between a strong association of male with career, and I'm not saying it here, but it also means female with family, to, uh, at the other extreme, a strong association of female with career. And you can see that that is something shown by a strikingly small <clears throat> three-tenths of one percent of, of those who have tried this test on the web, and there are about 63,000 respondents there. Uh, we can look at the pervasiveness of this stereotype, this Im implicit bias, this gender career stereotype, by summing these three purple bars, which show some degree of association of male with career. And it's 76%, which is quite a large number. Now, here's one that's an even stronger effect in terms of its pervasiveness. And this is an automatic preference or preference for young relative to old. And this one is, uh, this 80% showing some measurable degree of this is actually the largest uh, effect we get uh, for those on the web. This test has been taken by over 350,000. This is over about a four or five year period. And notice that the modal categorization of respondents is in this most extreme category. That wasn't the same for here, where the modal one was the moderate association. Going on, this is the test that's been taken most. It's one that involves classifying together white and black faces with pleasant and unpleasant words. And this one is, again, quite pervasive. It is 70% of these are mostly American respondents who have taken it, have shown uh, some measurable form of that bias. And that cuts across demographic categories with one exception. It is shown by all racial groups uh, except for uh, black. And you might think that black would show just the reverse, but they don't. They show about a third in the purple area, a third in the middle area of little or no preference, and a third uh, with the prefer showing some degree of preference for black. So how is level two involved in the IAT? Well, we live in an environment that is filled with associations of the kind that can be measured by the IAT. We can't help but take them in. Just as we take in oxygen through our mouth, nose, and lungs and store it as oxygen uh, or hemoglobin in our blood, uh, we take in the associations that are in the environment through our eyes and ears and we s store them in the neural pathways in our brain. It's as automatic as, as breathing, really. Uh, once we've acquired them, they can operate automatically. As we encounter some things such as uh, the name of a woman, perhaps attributes associated with female simply come into mind. Now, I want to give you an example of associations that you've probably acquired over the years. Uh, some of you may have to be uh, old enough uh, to have acquired some of these, but I can tell you I have. Uh, 
So if you can fill in the missing word there uh, in about a quarter of a second of thought, uh, you've been exposed to uh, an advertisement that probably hasn't appeared anywhere, at least not that I've seen for decades. Uh, lucky strike means fine tobacco. I'd walk a mile for a, right. Marlboro, what pops into mind? Well, if you don't immediately see the red package and the Western scene, uh, you've had your eyes closed <laughs> uh, because it, it's just having those associations is that inescapable. Some recent ones. Uh, yes, we can. Well, okay, so this has only been around for about two or three days now, right? <laughs> uh, and, and still, uh, you can come up with it. And we could do an IAT in which we have Obama and Clinton and the words can and will. And with the little experience you've had, you would go faster if we asked you to give the same response to Obama and can, Clinton and will, than if we reversed it and obliged you to give the same response to Clinton and can, Obama and will. Woman, what pops into mind? Is it family? Is it career? Is it executive? Is, is it office? Is it babies? Uh, well, we've already seen with the IAT we've done. The IAT gives us some indication of how strong these associations, that 300 milliseconds or so that it takes to oppose the associations is a measure of the strength of those associations. We use level one to overcome the level two associations. The IAT picks up our effort uh, in doing that, either in the errors we make or in its effect in slowing our, our speed. There are plenty of other situations in which one may want to use one's thoughtful mental uh, abilities to correct for things happening at level two. Uh, and I just list them here. I'm not going to go into the detail, but I'll uh, give, uh, I'll just mention a few of them. In the justice system, we could be concerned about jurors having biases that they may prefer not to have, but may nevertheless interfere with their evaluating evidence being offered in testimony uh, by witnesses of one race group rather than another, or elderly versus young. Uh, we may be concerned that jurors have uh, a bias against some categories of defendants, racial, ethnic, age, whatever. In education, oh, excuse me, a, a use of the IAT there might be to train jurors on automatic biases that might, may be operative in a case and alert them to the fact that they might want to use level one to fend off some effects of these biases. Now, bear in mind that jurors may display biases that they would prefer not to have, if they, but they don't even know that they have them. Uh, many people taking the IAT, those 70% or so who show some degree of association, are surprised, often shocked, to discover that they have that in their heads. I am no longer shocked. Uh, I happen to be the first person who found out uh, that he had it in his head because I created the first one of those and tried it on myself before anyone else. Uh, I was indeed shocked at the same time that I was quite excited about the potential of this uh, to reveal something because I could see in my own behavior this 300 millisecond effect. It was that much, that strong in me. Uh, in voting, uh, I'm concerned now about, we've got the first presidential election in which race and gender are represented other than white male in our presidential candidates. We are observing something very interesting in which pre-election polls are seriously mispredicting the results of the Democratic primaries. This is something that the pollsters aren't really pointing us to. Uh, they actually don't yet know what to do about it. I think we'll be hearing more about it. But there's strong indications that race, gender, perhaps both are involved in whatever is causing this discrepancy between pre-election polls and vote outcomes. Uh, 
I want to briefly describe just a couple of studies. Don't try to read this. This is mainly a reminder to me uh, what I want to tell you about. Just in the last uh, few years, researchers in a variety of disciplines are starting to do research looking at populations of societal importance. In this case, it's a study of managers who are involved in making hiring decisions. And this study was done by an economist in Sweden, Dan Olaf Ruth. And what he did was administer the, well, first he sent resumes to a large number of managers who had responsibility for hiring in Swedish uh, businesses in response to advertisements. And he included a simple variation in the content of the resumes. Either the name was a Swedish name or the name was a Muslim Arab name. And yes, the, Swed the ones with the Swedish names got more callbacks. But what he did was heroic, that was heroic, was to contact these same people uh, within the next year and have them take an IAT that involves the categories Swedish and Muslim with pleasant and unpleasant. So he was measuring what we call an implicit race attitude, or it's ethnic, excuse me, it's an ethnic attitude in this case. And he found, and this is the first such result that has come about in this kind of actual business situation, that the managers who were most likely to say no to the Muslim resumes were also the ones who showed the strongest uh, anti-Muslim automatic response on the IAT. The one, one other study I'm going to mention is one that uh, Lisa Cooper, who's giving another one of the lectures in this series, uh, has been associated with. And she has done the first study in which a group of primary care physicians were studied in their interactions with African American patients, and very careful coding was done of the interaction between the patients and the physicians, including scoring the affective quality of the interactions, and getting measures from both the physicians on this interaction and also, and here's uh, the really critical step, getting the physicians to take an IAT, a race attitude IAT, uh, actually both the one that has been taken by over a million people on the web now and another one that was created uh, just for this study to measure a stereotype that associates African American uh, versus white with characteristics of being compliant or resistant to uh, medical uh, care. So. All, in all of these areas, things are being done. I look forward to applications of the concepts of what we call implicit social cognition, which is our fancy name for the social thinking we do when operating at level two. And it is a type of, these are investigations of effects that many people who exhibit them would rather not be exhibiting, but lots of research now using the IAT, and there are perhaps 100 or so studies, not mostly laboratory studies, not like the two I just uh, described that are out in the real world, that have looked at correlations between IAT measures and various behaviors that are of interest, showing that, yes, there are correlations, and interestingly, they show up most clearly in domains involving stereotype and prejudice or intergroup discrimination. Uh, I think this is going to uh, move forward and be an important line of work uh, as long as we continue to be interested in level two, which I give another five or 10 years at least. Uh, here, are, I just want to list some of the people who have collaborated on this research over the last decade. And again, on this screen is the website at which you could go to find uh, 14 friendly IATs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Greenwald. We can now take a few questions, so please move to the microphones, and I'll start right over here. Oh. Hi, um, what spoke today is basically defined as conditioning by some other teachers. 
and you know the the gathering of the of this bias in the number two, what you call the unconscious, it gathers through the years, and some people refer to it as conditioning. And I don't know if you're familiar with the teacher Jiddu Krishnamurti, but he has quite incredible studies in this area, and he explains all this quite well. And I was wondering if you're familiar with him and what you think of his teachings. Uh, I'm afraid I don't know his teachings in detail, but you're right in, in saying that the ideas that I'm making use of are well established uh, in many contexts. They certainly go back uh, clearly to the beginning of the 20th century in the work of uh, especially Pavlov uh, in, in conditioning. So, no, I'm sorry, I just don't know the work that you're referring to. Thanks. Okay, well, next question over here. Yes. So once established, how do we over, not just override level two thinking, but how do we rewrite it? Yeah, this is a great question. And I can only say that I wish I had a really good answer to it. Because if you judge by trying to change performance on the IAT, it does not change easily. We know that we can move performance around a little by varying the situation in which it's measured. Uh, in some cases, we can give people things to think about before they do it that will change performance on the IAT. But we haven't successfully found anything that produces long-term effects. I do think that people are going to be looking for that. But because I know that it's difficult, and for example, I know that uh, my own performance on the race IAT has, although it's changed in the several hundred times I've taken it, it hasn't changed uh, as much as I might want it to change. Uh, this is very difficult to do, which is why I think our, the way we need to work against level two when we're not happy with level two, with what level two is doing, is to invoke level one and actively oppose. Ideally, and most of the time, level two is doing just what we want. Uh, but there are those circumstances in which it is not. Take the next question here. Um, I had a very similar question, which is that obviously the, the uh, process is, is really rapid and um, sort of reflexive. Um, and did you have? Any thoughts on how to change it? I mean, you, you obviously just answered that. And I, I'm wondering, is it, if you think it's possible to even be aware of it happening? Uh, well, I, if I understand your question, is what, when you are doing something at level two that, and you, it's using mental structures that you may not be aware that you possess, and that can certainly happen. Uh, and I've, we've illustrated a few of those here. Uh, can you be aware of its happening? And I would say, basically, the answer to that question is no, because that's what level two is all about. It's, it's, it's about your not being aware of what you're doing, and that's really its purpose. And so in order to become aware of it, you have to do something like take the IAT or some other procedure that might reveal the presence of mental contents that are ordinarily hidden. I have uh, what may be a dream that as people get more experience taking the IAT and discover uh, increasingly the population of associations that resides in their heads, some of this will actually approach being there consciously and, and are being aware of it. I mean, I can certainly now say that I am aware of having uh, several of the associations, or actually most of the associations, that one can measure with the IAT. And uh, Although, weren't you saying a moment ago that your responses had actually not really changed, even though you are aware of them? Exactly. It's, it's at, in one sense, my behavior is not changing on the IAT, but as a consequence of taking the IAT, I am aware that those associations are there. And maybe that's being the aware of them is not enough to change them, but being aware of them can be enough to, if, if you want to oppose them, to allow you to invoke level one and try Which to oppose gives them. gives you sort of a starting point. It gives you sort of a starting point for 
maybe even working on changing them or mm -hmm. whatever. Okay, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question over here. A long time ago, somebody told me that uh, a very simplistic formula for human behavior might be the degree that we have inherited certain characteristics, the degree of our own maturation, and the summation of our experiences to that point. Uh, you had said that with IAT, it is sometimes difficult to get much of a change. Uh, in relation to those three categories, uh, would you care to make a comment? Uh, no, excuse me, S say which categories uh, again? Heredity, maturation, and experience. Uh -huh. uh, well, experience is what I think formed the associations in the first place. I don't think they're inherited. Uh, maturation and experience maybe are two sides of the same coin. So I am a strong believer that the associations measured by the IAT are acquired associations rather than innate associations. If we seriously want to change things so that those associations would not form, you may have, be able to have an intuition about how radical a change that would require in our present media and cultural environment. I'm not optimistic about something like that happening in any kind of a hurry, even though I would be glad to say that I see that certain changes uh, would be regarded as desirable by many. There's some just First Amendment and other problems associated with doing such things. Take two more questions, first over here. Yes, I was uh, curious uh, when you were talking about you don't see any change, uh, but do you, do you see development? Is the IAT applicable to children and do you get to see the associations develop when you go younger and younger or is that not possible with the test? Yeah, I, I don't want to say too strongly that I see no change. I, it's, it's safer to say that we see little change, but the question about using the IAT with children has been of great interest because this gives us the opportunity to see how early in life these develop. Uh, a student uh, who just completed a PhD at University of Washington, uh, Daria Svencek, has developed procedures for working with young children, uh, preschoolers, with the IAT. They hear the words instead of having to read them and they have large buttons to press and it's all made into a game, but it actually works. And we are observing that some things related to gender, his dissertation concerned gender and math as an association. When, at what point do kids start associating math with male rather than female? And he found that it was quite early. It was apparent even in his first grade subjects. Uh, we d he didn't use preschool students with that one. Okay, question here. Dr. Greenwald, can IAT tests be used for marketing purposes to influence and even alter choices participants will make after the testing? Uh, excuse me, choices after what? After they've gone through the test. In other words, oh. by mixing them up like you did there, can you, mm -hmm. can you make people sometimes decide to do something that before the testing they might not have decided to do or uh, influence their decision. Okay, I think I understand the question. And I actually used to do some research on, or I still do actually, on subliminal perception. And that kind of question comes up there. Uh, and I'm, I'm skeptical about such effects, but I actually don't think the IAT is designed for that. I think the IAT has potentially significant uses in marketing because it can pick up associations and one of the things that advertisers are trying to do is to corner the market on a specific attribute associated with their product, perhaps quality, perhaps durability, uh, perhaps elegance, uh, any number of attributes. And the IAT can be used to measure that. I have, there are no strong programs of marketing research using it in process now, but I do know that there are quite a few people interested in developing those. Thank you. Well, please join me again in thanking Dr. Greenwald. Mm -hmm.